the suffering of Roxy in Mushoku Tensei Season 2, Episode 20 is worse than you think it was from Mr. Chibi Reviews. Let's see what you got to say. To give context to this scene, Roxy runs out of mana right here. She ran out of bladder space, that's what that happened. She leaked that holy water onto the ground. And she realizes all hope is lost. And literally in her act of desperation, realizing there's just nothing she can do. Yeah. You could just see the fear right on her face. It's on And totally. And if they really wanted to go to the dark route, I could have totally seen Roxy dying here. But Rudy coming to save her was just picture perfect. Even... I hear some people saying when long time ago Roxy was describing her ideal man in season one, something about the description matched how Rudy saved Roxy in this episode. Am I correct about that? Honestly, just such impressive character expression through the art. But to also showcase just more of just how desperate she was in the scene. Like, look very closely as swinging she's like just staff, kind of swinging yeah. her, you know, staff around trying to keep them back. They shoot it out of her hands and she realizes, like, there's nothing she can do. And, and you then, see, and like, then. her character, like, trembling here. She literally is trembling. Wait for it. And if you look very closely, the animators yeah. <laughs> even add in the fact that she wets herself. Like, she... Holy water, guys! The piss came out, and yes, I I did miss it in the anime reaction, right? When we were live reacting, and people was like, piss, piss, go check it out, go back. And I saw it, I was like, shit, did I miss something? So I took it an opportunity to go on a fucking rage fucking tantrum and say, shut the fuck up, motherfuckers! Are you piss? You wanna fucking smell the piss right now? I think it makes for fun content if I do that. He is so frightened, you can literally see that right there. And it's just like, it's crazy this is the first time in a very long time we have seen Roxy in person with new yeah. content. And this is basically the scene we see her with. It shows that she has had a very rough month inside this teleportation labyrinth. How has she and been surviving? Right? She, apparently she's been eating monster meat, like this is some dungeon messy shit. And then like, I guess she can stay hydrated because she's a water magician. So I guess she had, where's she poop? I wanna, that's the fucking light novel details that I want to know. Where does she poop? How does, how does that happen? Just taking a pee wherever she wants? How, how, does, how does any of that work? Basically, Rudy appearing before her eyes at the end here. Like, you know, he freezes all these monsters and, like, she sees yeah. him. It's such a very magical moment because I want to put it in perspective. It has been since episode 2 of Mushku Tensei Jobless Reincarnation. Like, it's been that long. It's been, like... 20, 30 episodes since then? It's actually ridiculous just how long it's been since Rudy has actually seen Roxy, even though, you know, Rudy has carried around his sacred shrine of her, basically. I wish that he still carried her right now and gave her the fresh pair of panties known as the sacred shrine right now and saying, you need this? You, you wet yourself? Since the beginning, and, you know, he always mentions her here and there, and so you always feel her presence within the story. He's always mentioning Roxy, but to yeah. actually have them meeting at last after so long, it's such a beautiful moment, honestly. And also the way that they met, which also apparently aligns with her description of the ideal man. So suddenly I'm thinking, Thinking, who's Sylphie? Who's Eris? We got Roxy back. And there's something I want to point out as well, is that this very sequence that happened. This is what I'm talking about. One day a tall, slim young man who's manly but makes childless expression will save me by chance in the depths of a labyrinth. Literally a prophecy. Grooming? <laughs> Roxy out here grooming Rudy when he was a kid. <laughs> Happened was hinted at a very Cancel long Roxy! time ago. This happened basically in season one, where Roxy talks to, I believe, Elena Lise about like what her dream guy would be if she was to get with someone, and she basically foreshadows what actually happened in the dungeon, the teleportation labyrinth. That she has a bit of a damsel in distress, save the princess kind of fantasy, huh? She wanted to find someone that would basically go into the depths to save her from a uh, labyrinth, so to speak. And then, you know, they would work together and then they would fall in love with each other, so to speak. That is what she has been seeking. And then, obviously, this scene happened in today's episode. So, foreshadowing's there. It's pretty awesome. You love to see it when it's an cool. kind of puts the pieces together to really hint at something that is potentially going to happen. All
I wonder if Roxy understood or even remembered that scene when meeting Rudy. Then he's like, oh my god, this is my ideal man. Obviously, it's not going to be so easy for it to work out because obviously Rudy is a married man now. So there's definitely going to be a lot more complications to... Concubines are fine, according to Sylphie. ...to what uh, Roxy wants here. But that is still food for thought that the foreshadowing has been here since the very beginning. Now, there is something I want to talk about, okay? A nitty-gritty detail about this sequence that I feel like was lost in the adaptation of the anime, and it's not bad. Okay. Like, I, I want to clarify before I go any further that this episode legitimately, it handled this Roxy sequence so good. I'm not really upset about it in any way, but I do feel what? like there was one thing that was lost that I what? feel like anime onlys should be aware what of is to it? really show the gravity of the situation is that when this was in the light novel, okay, like when this was written in the light novel that I read a while back, you know, okay. there was a whole chapter dedicated to Roxy, basically entering into the teleporter and randomly teleporting into the dungeon, and then she tried to find her way out. There was like three different paths or whatever of different teleportations, and she didn't want to necessarily go through one because it could be very dangerous. And Basically, the anime cut out the stuff that Roxy was trying to survive in the month for. Like, the one month of sur survival is what they skipped, right? She basically came to the realization that she was trapped in this dungeon, and she was just trying to hold out until someone potentially could find her. And basically... And how did Rudy find her? By something about the condensation of water in the labyrinth. Did he also hear something? Did he smell something? Bro ain't Tanjiro. I don't know, but there was a drip of water falling down from the cave. And then Rudy was like, huh? Right? Instinct? Water? This Roxy uses water. He could smell her holy water. That shit's rancid piss, my man. Basically, she was stuck here for an entire month within this dungeon, just relentlessly fighting nonstop day after day. And pretty much, you know, the episode does let us know that, yes, yeah, she's been gone for a month, but it doesn't truly let us know just how much of a hell it, of an experience it was for Roxy being stuck in this dungeon. For instance, she, at one point in the light novel chapter of this happening, she encased herself basically into a hole. She was was in a hole to where monsters really okay. could reach her, and she would drag in like the corpses of the monsters and stuff and eat their poisonous oh. flesh just to be able to survive. Okay, Hajime from Arifureta, what? Poisonous flesh? How would she detoxify that? And she was trying to save her magic because she couldn't really cast a lot of fire magic. I mean, the episode even clarifies that. Like, you know, if fire was used a lot in this little space, it would basically cause carbon to, um, monoxide poisoning and you would just die. So yeah, apparently we shouldn't be using fire or water, right? Roxy was using water all she fucking wanted and some other shit too. And I was like, this probably is not a big problem though, right? So she couldn't really use fire much to get rid of everything. And so she was most of the time time eating just like raw monster meat just to survive for a full month and you gotta imagine Ew. the effects that would do on your body because you can't use fire because it would cause poison in the air you have to survive and continuously fight just to not die for a full month waiting for the inevitable if someone's going to be able to save you or not and that is raw literally raw just like bear grill is out there you're just surviving outside in the wilderness but it's a labyrinth and just raw poisonous monster meat for an entire month how did her how does she even survive like could you have some kind of healing magic some kind of Detox, does detox magic fucking exist? I guess it does, huh? And obviously being stuck in a very dark and dank labyrinth at that, that is just mysterious dank. and old. You know, your hopes of survival just ticks down and your, your chances of survival just goes close to zero every passing day. But... On top of that, you know, if you're stuck in this dark labyrinth, you're going to just lose your sense of time. You're not going to know how long you're necessarily stuck in there. Like, you're surrounded by monsters, you can't see the sunlight or anything. You know, time will just start to stretch to where maybe what feels like an like what's normally an hour could feel like maybe six hours. Because when you're constantly fighting and having to worry about survival, your just anxiety and mental focus is just so longer. on edge that you're never going to have a moment where you're probably not thinking until you just pass out from anxiety. Oh yeah, you're right. It was the succubus pheromones. I, I thought the detox was literally putting the chastity belt on his dick. 
but yeah, yeah, that, that did happen. Exhaustion. And speaking of magic exhaustion, we know from the very early episodes of Mushiku Tensei, when someone, you know, gets Runs out of mana. Know, exhausted, like when they use too much magic, they just straight up pass out. Look at what Rudy happened to Rudy throughout, you know, the first two episodes. So when you factor all this in, Roxy was always at the precipice of pushing herself to the point to where she would just pass out. And then obviously if she passed out in mid-fighting with monsters, she would just straight up die. And so this moment was very critical here that what it was showing is that she pushed her magic to the point where when she did her enchantment to try to make an earth fortress to safeguard herself, magic yeah. didn't come out. Pretty much where she has nothing left. If she was to cast anything else, she's just going to pass out. And what is the odds of Rudy showing up at that exact moment to save her, dude? The princess, like a damsel in distress. So it's just the desperation here is just ridiculous. And I do love like how the you know, episode conveyed this. But like I said, that month time that you didn't really get to see really just amplifies the misery in hell that Roxy was going through. Maybe next episode they'll like give us a little bit of a uh, flashback scenes of what Roxy had to deal with when, you know, talking with by herself for a very long time like i want to reinstate exactly everything she went through by herself for a full month not knowing what a sense of time is because time just is probably extending you know eating poisonous food mm. having to exert yourself magic wise and physically and mentally constantly for every day for a full month but on top of that you know sticking into a tight crevasse and not being able to move and potentially just you know having to use the bathroom on your location yeah how does that or is she just fucking shitting her pants and just burying it with earth magic? Not showering, the stench and everything. You know what I would be doing? I'd fucking take a fucking dookie and just throw that log at the monsters. That I would like, if I was Roxy and I'm just at this point of insanity, straight up, I'd start throwing my shit at them because I would like lose it. I'd be like, fuck you monsters! Just taking my fucking shit and throwing at them, bro. Bucking my fucking piss, just throwing at them. Fuck you! It would just be so foul, not including the decaying corpses potentially of the Ugh. creatures that's within the cave as well. There's just so much to really consider when it comes to just what she was dealing with. So it's it's just crazy. And What about the labyrinth prevents you from using earth magic to just like get out? How does that work? Even like she's, in ca she's captured here. These are like magical restraints where you can't just change. Like, could we not... I don't know. It feels like Rudy can just extend the fucking pillar and climb onto the top of a fucking mountain with earth magic if he wanted to. Why can't we like do that in a labyrinth? Like what prevents us from just like changing the labyrinth as we want using earth magic? So, seeing this moment here with, you know, how it was foreshadowing to, like, her wanting to be saved and stuff. Cave you know, like how this foreshadowing, you know. Like, like, if we accidentally use too much earth magic, then potentially everything would fall down and we'd be all just caved in. But the whole point of using the earth magic to get out is to... Just get out before the cave-in happens. I I'm not sure. It happened, but I don't think Roxy really appreciated, you know, probably having to go through the experience. But uh, with that being said, though, I want to talk about the Paul and Rudy stuff because I think that this is very important. But the amount of death flags for my man Paul is insane right now. Because it kind of continues what was established in, like, episode 16, 17 of season 1 of Mushiku Tensei. And yeah. I feel like it plays a huge part just showcasing the development that, you know, not just Rudy has experienced, but, but Paul. also Paul has experienced as well. Before when we met him in season 1, what happened? We beat the shit out of him because he was drunk, alcoholic, and he was depressed down on his luck because he couldn't take a dub. All he kept was taking L's, right? So when Rudy showed up, being also competent, he lashed out at Rudy when he shouldn't have because of his own insecurities of not being able to do well. And then forced upon Rudy, a kid, saying, if you're so talented, why don't you fucking save everybody, right? Just because he was upset. And then we had a talk. We hashed it out. Norm didn't understand. We hashed it out. And now he's actually kind of proud, right? He's actually pretty proud of what Rudy is. And he's like accepting of how good Rudy is and it's much better compared to before for sure well and his group it's just something that you know needs to be discussed because I feel like that period in Mushku Tensei for season one was a very big turning point for the community that really I think not an actual turning point but a turning point for the community perhaps the turning point was the spreading of the bread that happened before the scene amplified people's enjoyment of the story because of just how realistic and human their overall argument was and i agree that episode hit me out of fucking nowhere bro 
a fist fight between a dad and a son where the dad lashes it on the son, the son's beating on his ass. I'm like, oh my god. This is getting way too real. Fallout as father and son. So Paul and Rudy, they're Both Rudy and Sylphie has now beat the fuck out of Paul. Sylphie probably took it even further, right? Didn't Sylphie almost kill Paul when she found out that Rudy was sent off to Eris or something? Right? So now both both Paul's son and daughter-in-law, <laughs> yeah, they both fucking clapped his ass, right? Her relationship has always been complex, to <laughs> say the least. Okay. We know that because of Rudy being technically reincarnated in this world, you know, he never fully viewed Paul and Zenith as his mother and father, because yeah. that's technically how some would view it. Like, if you were reincarnated and had your old memories of your previous life from, like, Japan or wherever, and, you know, you had now new parents in this new world, you probably wouldn't instantly, you know, don't think that they're your parents you'd probably yeah i mean he even calls refers to paul not as father but as paulo in his head when he's thinking about it right he thinks of paul as like a fucking not an npc but like a playable character that is his dad, which is the role, but doesn't see him as dad. Yeah, the daddy's cool moment was peak, though. I think of your old parents and all that, and you wouldn't really call them mo mom or dad, like, seriously. You would just say that just because you have to, because you technically are their biological son in this world. Rudy had this very complex relationship, and especially with Paul of all people. And obviously, Paul at an early age, when, you know, Rudy was young, you know, he wasn't able to be the father figure that he wanted to be because Rudy was kind of already a grown adult. His mental mind was not like a kid of like a five-year-old or yeah. four-year-old. He was basically a grown adult mindset. And what is the main talking point people use to defend Rudy ex heiress at the end of season one that Rudy was mentally stunted therefore even though he's a grown ass man in a child's body heiress you know preyed upon him using his you know insecurity and <laughs> That's what people like, well, he's not mentally mature enough to, you know, quote unquote, like, groom Aries. I don't want to talk about that. That is, that is water under the bridge. We move on. Obviously very childish and didn't have a really good view of the world, but he still was definitely more knowledgeable of things than how maybe a five-year-old would be. And so you factor all this stuff in, Paul wasn't able to give life lessons or teach Rudy in a way that, you know, he would have wanted because he didn't have many chances to be a father to him, which is one of the big reasons why Rudy and Paul had such a falling out in episode 16 and 17 is because after a while Paul started viewing his own son as a just like an adult a very mature adult <laughs> that was so intelligent so well like smart and had so much wisdom that you know Paul would never be able to compare to him and Paul wasn't upset about that he didn't feel like necessarily upset that he was inferior to his son he just had such high expectations of his son because right. how intelligent he was and how he just had a good grasp on the world therefore if you're so good then you should be able to save everyone else while I'm keep failing that was the whole mindset back in the day that he never thought that his son would actually act like a child sometimes and so when that obviously happened in episode 16 and 17 and 18 you know, we know the fallout that happened and eventually their misunderstanding to talking it out and all that. It was a very beautiful moment and it really is one of my favorite scenes of the entirety of the anime of Mushoku Tensei. Really? Well, some people value those emotional bonding moments, right? I'm a monkey. I love hype shit happening. My favorite Mushoku Tensei moment still has got to be Orsted showing up. That entire episode, the entire encounter with Orsted and Nanahoshi, absolutely fucking peak. And so seeing their rekindling of father and son relationship in this episode, how they have a little moment and all that, there's an understanding. Rudy mentions that he's sorry that he couldn't do more and try to find, you know, like his mother Zenith. And then Paul doesn't try to blame him and all that. And then Paul's like, oh, you have a kid, you're married and all that. He gets very happy about basically being a grandpa. There's but these are flags. Death flags. There's a lot of stuff that happens within the scene that just shows the maturity of both characters and how they finally have a good grasp on the relationship with each other. And that, you know, Rudy really does see Paul as his father now. And obviously we know Paul's Daddy's always so Rudy cool. as his son. It's just nice. And then this little exchange here while they're like going through the labyrinth and stuff and you Daddy. see like Paul trying to show off in front of Rudy. It's a very Paul-like thing to do, but a very father-like thing to do. Wanting to, to make yourself look cool for your child. And yeah. just seeing that little scene, it's really cool. 
I, I just, I love that. It's a very sweet and endearing scene. Yeah, sweet and endearing so he can butter us up so that if Paul fucking dies, we're going to remember these short moments where, you know, father and son times and we're going to feel even fucking worse about it. That's what I'm afraid of. And then you have Elena Lisa's that's like, stop getting in front of me and all that. And the reason for this was to basically kind of rein in Paul from trying to show off because even though Paul was trying to show off for, to Rudy, it could create bad habits. And she didn't want that as well because obviously this is a very dangerous dungeon. Anything could happen. And, you know, she wants to make sure Paul stay safe. So Elena Lee's obviously being someone that's more of a, like, trying to keep it straight-laced and not try to, you know, do anything dangerous. I really respect that, you know, from her character. But at the same time, seeing Paul show off, it's a very rare moment for him, and it kind of plays into his character why the argument happened in Season 1, is that Paul doesn't get to act like a father a lot to Rudy. And so in this moment, he really felt like he was getting to be a father figure showing off for his son. He was even talking about Ro and Rudy of like, so how is um Sophie's cheeks, right? It's not like it's it's, it's like a father or something to do to talk about mature stuff like that together, right? It's just a very cute and adorable moment, kind of showcasing the father and son relationship. But uh, overall, and. Uh... The grandma-in-law relationship, which is Paul's mom-in-law now. Well, the episode is really interesting. There's a lot of depth and detail to it. I mean, we have this whole little conversation with, like, uh, Rudy and Paul talking about... <laughs> talking about their doing the deed, so to clapping. speak, with the maid. It's just, uh... A wild moment, honestly, right in front of her at that. Just, uh... Yeah, there, there's so much here. I mean, I just... I love Mushku Tensei. Great... No mention of Tall Hand, though. No mention of Tall Hand, you know, staring at Rudy's gat, just, you know, right behind him in the order of walking when, you know, in the labyrinth as well. Great episode, honestly. And yeah. I mean, we even had this moment where the dwarf man. There it you know, is! Tall there it Hand, is! I believe that's how you say his name. You know, he was hitting on Rudy. He literally checked him out. We literally had a whole sequence for that. There's just so much, honestly. <laughs> that was such an. I just got blindsided by this dude because I don't know much about the dwarf other than him chastising Arena Rise for just taking five separate back shots at once in season one. I don't know much about this guy. Then we get to actually see what he's about and it's like, oh, I see. Oh man, you're in the wrong anime. You should be in fucking, you know, I was reincarnated as a seventh prince. Like, imagine him in the anime with Lloyd, bro. ...in this episode, and you gotta love how sometimes shame, like, unshameless, or how shameless, you know, Mushiku Tensei can be, but I think that's one of the big reasons why I can respect it as well. But, uh, yeah, overall, that's the episode of Mushiku Tensei today. Uh, Y'all know what to do. Please go give Mr. Chibi Reviews a like. It's up to this channel if you haven't. I agree, this episode was fantastic. There is definitely things that I didn't know. About, you know, Roxy's obviously survival in the one month in the labyrinth, which I hope will be mentioned briefly next episode. But essentially, it's just, you're just in a small, tight quarter space, running out of mana, no food, gotta eat poison flesh, can't even use fire to cook it. And then you're running out and it's just, you, you're shitting, you're pissing on the ground and monsters are creeping in. And then Rudy coming to save her like that, probably not the moment that she was envisioning, right? She probably thought it would be much more... I don't know, like a princess getting saved by a prince type of deal, but imagine that. Roxy just pissed her pants, just dookie everywhere, just nasty ass, no shower happened. I mean, she has water magic, so maybe she cleaned her up. But then Rudy showing up at the end with the ice, that shit was peak. I just hope that we're not setting up potentially for more death flags.